to Crafts and Crimes, where tonight I'm going to talk to you about H. H. Holmes and the infamous Murder Castle. Let's just get right into it. Oh, I'm going to show you a picture of my dog because this is going to get dark and, and that's going to hopefully get you in a good space, good head space. So H. H. Holmes, his name when he was born was Herman Webster Mudgett born in 1890, sorry, 1861, but you may know him as Henry Howard Holmes. He changed his name, and he's commonly known as H.H. H. Holmes, an American serial killer. Now, he confessed to 27 murders, but only nine have really been confirmed. However, he was a real son of a bitch, a real uh, con artist, a bigamist, and a subject of many, many lawsuits. So, let's get into it. H. H. Holmes was born, like I said, uh, as Herman Webster Mudgett. I don't know why these names don't last. Jesus Christ, imagine having that handle. In New Hampshire uh, in 1861. Now, his father was a farmhand and a house painter and devout Methodist. I don't know if that's supposed to mean he's a good person, but that's what it says in, in these notes. And so, though modern serial killers um, are usually described having tortured animals or setting fires, etc., he really didn't have that much um, in his childhood. There's really no proof that he was abused by his parents or partook in, in any of those other serial killer red flags. Uh, he graduated at the age of 16 and took some jobs in nearby Alton, and he married his first wife. Clara Lovering in Alton. They had a son, and that actual bloodline will come up later on. So he became, uh, the son became a public accountant, and he, he was a he served as city manager, all in all a good man. Uh, Holmes entered university in Burlington at 18, left after a year, and he moved on to Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery. So he got his med degree. So that's why we call him Dr. H.H. H. Holmes. Um, he worked in the anatomy lab, and then he was the chief anatomy instructor. Holmes had apprenticed under Dr. Uh, Naham Wright, and this doctor was a, an advocate of human dissection. And you can imagine in the 1800s, uh, that kind of thing might have been considered kind of witchcrafty and you know, don't chop up the bodies or misuse the dead bodies. But this is when science was really coming of age here, and they were just learning that if you explored the body after death, there was so much you could learn. So Holmes was really into that. Um, after, you know, once he was suspected of murder years later, and he claimed he was not, of course, um, he admitted to using cadavers to fraud life insurance companies, and that will come up as we discuss Holmes a little bit later. So he was um, quite a fraudster. Now, they he, he lived with housemates when he was in school, and again, he was married to Clara, and his housemates have said that he treated Clara very violently. Um, Luckily, I think she may have been one of the wives that got it alive because he ends up marrying other women while still married to Clara, and they are never seen from again. So he's working as a uh, anatomy lab instructor, and he is living with people uh, who are also in med school. And uh, a boy disappears in the area where he spends his time. He claimed the boy went back to Massachusetts where he was from, but he had been spending time with Holmes and things were suspicious. He was never charged. It was just their first sign. Later on, he got a position at a drugstore, which is hard to understand why this person with a medical degree was all over the place as a pharmacist, working in an anatomy lab, um, and not really using his medical degree the way you would expect. But I think because he was such a fraudster and such a con man, he couldn't stay in one place very long. And, and that's just what I think. Who knows? Um, 
So while he was working in a pharmacy, a boy died after taking a concoction Holmes uh, gave him. And that is the second thing that pops up that makes people start to wonder if Holmes is uh, trouble. So of course accidents happen and that's what he would claim, uh, but it, he was starting to get the notice of the authorities at this time. Um, moving on, Holmes had a daughter. Uh, he did file divorce from Clara and married a new woman, Murda. The divorce never became final, so he was still married to Clara when he married Murda, which makes him a bigamist. Um, and he alleged infidelity on her part, so the suit went nowhere. He was really litigious, and he was either being sued or suing someone, and that's got to put some red flags up for people as well. So anyway, he has a daughter with this, his second wife. Uh, her name's Murda, and her daughter's name is Lucy Holmes. She was born in 1889, and... Chicago, Illinois. And this is where the saga of the murder castle actually takes place in Chicago. Because at that time, the World's Fair was up and running. It was uh, had two different names. Oh, I'll find the other one in my notes here, but the World's Fair is what it's mainly known as. Not the, I mean, there's a couple of different World's Fairs over the course of history, and this was not um, the, the major one. But it, it was kind of a big deal. He had three wives by the time um, he moved to Chicago. And here's the thing. When women were moving out of their parents' home in the late 1800s, it was the first time in history, as far as I can tell from these notes, that they could be alone or could travel alone. And what was happening is they were leaving either their father or their husband's care, because up until this point, they really could not work outside the home. So the World's Fair drew a lot of women to Chicago because you could get work there as a seamstress or a stenographer or, you know, whatever job they were allowing women at that time. And so women were going to Chicago in like, uh, you know, great rates on these trains because they wanted independence and that was their first taste of independence. So they were quite an easy target for this sociopath. So uh, we're, we're, Holmes has three wives. Maybe he didn't get the third one yet. Maybe I'm ahead of myself. He has two wives, two kids. He's moving all over the place. He's in Chicago. And this is when he changes his name to H.H. H. Holmes. So remember he was born Herman Webster Mudgett. And in Chicago, after trying to divorce Clara and marrying Murda, he changes his name to H.H. H. Holmes, and he comes across a woman named Elizabeth S. Holton. And she has a drugstore with her husband. And I think it's still, like, the area is still there. Certainly the drugstore is different, but there's still the, you know, the bones of the building are still, and there's pictures here in these articles I've printed and, and you know, it's, the area is infamous, and I'm sure if you can visit Chicago, you can visit this area. And it was on the corner of South Wallace Avenue and West 63rd, if that makes any sense to you. Anyway, Holton felt bad for him. She was an older lady, and she gave him a job. And she said he proved to be a hardworking employee, and he eventually bought the store. But buying the store, he promised to make payments. And remember, he's a con man. So he eventually bought the store, in quotation marks, but he didn't ever come through with the, uh, all the payments. So a lot of people think that that um, Elizabeth Holton and her husband disappeared. And, you know, when you, people talk about A.J. Holmes, they talk about how he took over this store, promised to pay for it, and all of a sudden the owner and her sick husband disappeared. But it turns out that that is a myth, and they actually filed suit because Holmes didn't pay them for what he promised for the drugstore. And uh, that I didn't go anywhere because I think in that time, like you really, you know, paper trails would be as far as you could get on following someone and, and taking someone to court. But when the money ran out, so would the, the ability to fight in court. And, and this guy was just such a, such a scumball, such a low life that he was able to take uh, the drugstore. And 
when Elizabeth's husband died because he was very sick when Holmes actually went to work for her. She had to move on. Um, so Holmes did purchase an empty lot across the street. Uh, he's, now he's really scammed multiple people at this point. He's moving all around. His name has changed. And he decided to build a two-story mixed-use building. A mixed-use building, whatever that means, uh, it was supposed to have some apartments, some retail spaces. And so what he would do is he would hire people to do the work, contractors and such, and then when they finished, he would accuse them of doing shitty work and then sue them. So he would never really have to pay them because things would get all tied up in legal fees and, and he would never have to pay. So he ends up getting this building built. He didn't pay the architects. He didn't pay the steel company. Um, they sued each other. I mean, he's, I mean, I think nowadays he would be caught much sooner based on how, you know, computers would put these things together and, and, but back then he was a new person because he had a new name. So they did not know of his previous, uh, time, um, suing people. So, um, he decided this building, this mixed use building would become a hotel for the upcoming World's Columbia Exposition. That's what it was called. The World's Fair was actually called the World's Columbian Exposition. So um, the hotel portion of this building was never finished. It's some, sometimes people call it the Murder Hotel. I've called it that when H.H. H. Holmes uh, stories have come up and I've you know read or listened to things about it. But really, he never did finish the hotel part. But when people like where later, and I know I'm jumping ahead, um, exploring the building after everything went down, they found there were mazes, there were um, soundproof rooms, there were place hallways that didn't seem to go anywhere. Like it was really creepy. And probably what he had done is hired so many different contractors and and builders that no one knew what the other one was doing. So he was able to create this really creepy building, the murder castle as, as we have come to know it. And, and a lot of what we know comes from his own writing because there's not a lot you can, uh, you know, find out in history books other than what things he has confessed. And it's hard to, of course, believe someone who is a, com a con man and a liar and so we're not entirely sure, um, other than the accounts of others, what really happened. So in 1892, so remember the World's Fair was uh, to begin in 1893, uh, the hotel was somewhat completed and there were three stories in the basement. So the first store, or the first floor was the storefront, the second um, consisted of what were are being called elaborate torture rooms, which contained a chute that led to the basement. I know it's getting dark now. And the floor, the third floor had more apartment rooms. So let's talk about the first murders before we get into that. Um, so one of his early murders was his mistress. So not only did he have multiple wives, he had mistresses. So, you know, she was the wife of Ned Smith. Her name was Julia. It might be Smythe, I don't know, Smythe, Smith. It's got that Y in it, so I don't know how to pronounce it. And um, she'd moved into his building because she was working at the jewelry counter in one of the, uh, the pharmacy that he had originally worked at and taken over. And he encouraged her to move into his building uh, because uh, her husband found out about the affair and he quit his job and left her. So, of course, she would have been alone. She had the custody of her daughter, Pearl. And she remained at that hotel and continued her relationship with Holmes um, because it really, it was difficult for a woman without a husband in that time. So Julia, his mistress, and her daughter, Pearl, disappeared on Christmas Eve. And Holmes later claimed she died during an abortion, though that was never confirmed. And he had another, it says paramour here in the notes, and I obviously copy and pasted that from Wikipedia or something, and I'm not going to, that's not a word I would use. So we'll say uh, mistress, and her name was Emmeline Sagrande, and she began working in the building in 1892 and disappeared that December. Another woman who vanished, her name was Edna Van Tassel, and she also spent time in that building and is believed for, um, to be one of 
homes as victims. So thousands of women were arriving on these trains to the World Fair looking for work, looking for independence, and they wanted to live and work in the hotel, and he could afford that to them. Women didn't have jobs outside the home, as I said, so they were becoming independent and they were getting a taste of freedom, and sadly, this was exactly what this asshole wanted. He was, this was the kind of person he was hunting, uh, so to speak. Um, at this, this is in America, Chicago, as I said, but at the same time in England, Jack the Ripper was actually committing his murders, and I said, hold on to the name earlier of his son, of H.H. H. Holmes' son, because the, I think it's the great, great grandson of H.H. H. Holmes, or the, uh, the son, the line from the son from his first wife, Clara, he thinks that his great, great, great grandfather, whatever, was Jack the Ripper, but there's nothing to um, confirm that. Like, I think that might just be him trying to get, I don't know, screen time, whatever. Um, it just, it, it can't be. Uh, so, um, 1893, early 1893, Holmes has met a guy, he's a carpenter, and he has a criminal past, and his name is Benjamin Pitezel, Pit I don't know how to say it, and this, he kind of becomes his right-hand man, so he, he uses this guy in criminal schemes. Um, I don't know if this guy knew with a criminal past, maybe he did, but it, I couldn't find anywhere where he was complicit in any of these like evil things that we know Holmes committed. So 1893, the actress Minnie Williams moved to Chicago, and Holmes claimed to have met her at the employment office, but they say he'd known her years earlier, and he offered her a job at the hotel as the, his personal stenographer, and she accepted. So she also persuaded, or he persuaded Williams to transfer the deed to her property to a man named Alexander Bond, which is one of Holmes' aliases. Now, I don't know why he was getting all these women. I'm looking at this picture of him, and he's got this really, like, he's like this mustachioed, he looks like a, like a, I don't know, you know the bat, you know Wyatt Earp, that movie? If you're anywhere in your 40s, you probably remember this Kurt Russell, Val Kilmer, um, Wyatt Earp movie. It was really good. He looks like, like, the asshole cop, you know, sheriff guy that was trying to piss off or trying to get Wyatt Earp. And he has this, like, stupid bowler hat that's kind of curled up on both sides. And his mustache is, like, it, it looks fake. It could be his own character. He's not handsome. He looks like a, he's trying to look like a gentleman, but anyway, whatever. Black and white picture of him. He looks like a goof. Oh, did you know Leonardo DiCaprio, I think, is either was making or is making a movie where he's going to be H.H. H. Holmes. So, yeah, I would totally want to see that. Um, anyway, okay. So she transfers the deed to her property over to the alias of home. So he's taken her for everything she's got. And um, her sister came to visit. And both of the sister and Minnie went missing, of course. They were never seen alive again, though we really don't have any proof whether um, he had anything to do with it. But if you're looking at the history, his track record, of course he did. It's ridiculous. Of course he did. So Holmes, he was a very ambitious um, and a lot of con men are, you got to work hard at that. He was a very ambitious person and he had an entrepreneurial spirit. So he decided to sell the skeletons of the people he killed because skeletons and cadavers, they were used regularly in science, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, medical schools, whatever. And so he, he sold them to labs and schools and, um, he sometimes hired an assistant, uh, to help him and, he was accused of stripping flesh off bodies, dissecting them and preparing them because that was his profession. He, if you remember, like that was what he, he did in medical school. So, um, he really had no problem with, uh, a corpse and taking it apart and, uh, you know, whatever. I don't want to gross you out. Maybe, maybe you're eating. Um, anyway, can you imagine if he killed you and you ended up being, uh, cadaver in a medical school or something I guess you wouldn't know but you're like fuck I already got killed by this fucker and now they're using my body to you know for 
first year med students to fucking, oh, that was anyway, so that. All right, let's see. There's gonna, I gotta get moving. We're gonna run out of time here. There's so much about this guy. Oh, okay, so anyway, um, Mudget. I'd like to call him Mudget because he probably hated that little stupid name, Herman Webster Mudget. Anyway, let's go. Let's, uh, let me go. Where was I? Where was I? All right. So anyway, let's multiple women uh, and the boy we talked about earlier um, went missing. And of course, the boy that died from the concoction he made as a pharmacist. So, you know, we have uh, where I think we're up to nine. Are we up to nine murders now? The confirmed murders. Although if you, you know, popular culture will tell you he killed over 200 people. He claims to have killed 27 probably nine. Um, so he has lawyers and insurance companies and everybody after him because his cons are catching up to him. And he, so he disappears from Chicago. People are thinking, okay, they, there's something weird going on with this guy. He's always in trouble. People are going missing around them. So finally, in 1894, he was arrested and he was incarcerated for a short time for selling um, mortgage goods. I don't know what that means. I highlighted that, and I, for some reason I thought that was important to tell you, but I don't know what that means. Selling mortgaged goods. I don't know. <clears throat> anyway, he was promptly bailed out. But he struck up a conversation with an outlaw named Marion Hedgepeth, and that outlaw was serving 25-year sentence, so Holmes said, you know, this is how, this is like, I, this is how brilliant he is. He's like, how about um, I fake your death Oh, no, no, you fake your death, and I fake my death, and we become each other's, um, what do you call it, the person, you know, who gets the, the life insurance, and I don't know why he thought this would be so brilliant, so the, the, the scheme didn't work out, of course, so he was going to fake his own death, and the insurance company became suspicious, because he had access to corpses, right, because, you know, he was murdering people, and so he must have found someone that he could... You know, what? it wasn't like there was DNA. It wasn't like you could take their fingerprints and prove who it was. Like if someone said, that dead body, I saw, you know, I saw H.H. H. Holmes go into the building and there was a fire and now there's a body in there. And that was really what you had to take um, for truth. So it wouldn't have been as hard to fake your death as, as it would be today. Anyway, he didn't press the issue because he knew um, the insurance company was on to him. But he did try it again with his, his good buddy, Petzl or Pietzel? I can't say that. I don't know. So the, he agreed to fake his own death. The Petzl guys? Let's just call him Petzl. Stupid name. They have some stupid names. Uh, I'm so sorry if your name is Petzl or M Munchet or what did I say? Mudget or whatever. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that was a stupid name, but anyway. So he's going to fake his own death. Um, and she was, and his wife was going to collect ten thousand dollars, which I don't know what that would be in like today's money. Like what? Like I don't know, five hundred thousand. I don't know. Look it up. And uh, she was going to split that money with Holmes, but obviously it it called for Petzl to set himself up as an inventor under the name of B. F. Perry, and then be killed and disfigured in a lab explosion. So he, there was no shortage of drama. So and he was going to get knocked unconscious with chloroform. And his body was going to be found, but it wasn't really going to be him. Uh, but uh, instead, Holmes said, sorry, Holmes was to find an appropriate cadaver to play the role, but then Holmes knocked him out with chloroform. Of course, he would have access to that. And then set his body on fire and actually killed him. So this was his buddy, though. He was getting to help run his scheme. And this guy, like, he was just, you know, no rules among serial killers, I guess. He, um, he implied Petzl was still alive and after he used the chloroform on him and that he got caught in the fire and it was not his fault, it's blah, 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 blah. But later uh, it was presented in trial that the chloroform had been administered after his death. Anyway, probably to fake suicide. I don't know. I don't know what, Holmes, no one knows what Holmes was thinking. Excuse me. All right. Um, so he was trying to collect that payout. So his unsuspecting wife and her, her uh, three of her five children 
were in homes of custody after this because uh, women had to be in the man's custody, of course. And homes in three of the potential children traveled throughout the North United States. But of course, uh, he was staying, he, he, he was so psycho, he took his wife along a separate route, separating her from her children, and she was very close to her children, apparently, as he was lying to her about where they were, and he said they were missing, but they really, he had them in a, a location that, you know, were near enough to her that she had no idea. He confessed he murdered the girls, Alice and Nellie, by forcing them into a large trunk and locking them inside. <coughs> and he drilled a hole, oh, gross, and in the trunk and put one end of a hose through the hole, attaching the other end to a gas line to asphyxiate the girls. And he buried them. And who knows what he did with her, their bodies before that. And uh, the boy went missing, but I'm not sure we have any, and I'm sure it's in the confession, but I couldn't find it, um, what happened to Howard, the boy. Um, so, Frank Geyer, a Philadelphia police detective, is trying to investigate Holmes. <coughs> Excuse me. And finding three missing children, found the two girls, uh, the decomposing bodies of the two girls. And he wrote, The deeper we dug, the more horrible the odor became. And when we reached the depth of three feet, we discovered what appeared to be the bone of the forearm of a human being. So uh, he was on to Holmes. And... He, and Holmes's murder spree was finally ended there in Boston on November 17, 1894, after he was tracked by the Pinkertons, actually. I mean, Frank Dyer may have been the, the uh, detective that was on to him, but the Pinkertons actually found him. And uh, he was arrested on an outstanding warrant. Um, so he was in the company of his unsuspecting third wife at this time. He was put on trial for murder. Okay, pause. I have to cough. <coughs> okay, sorry. It's dry up here. He was put on trial for murder, um, just for the murder of the, the one they could prove, his, his buddy Benjamin Petezel, and was found guilty and sentenced to death. Um, by that time, it was, it was evident that he had murdered the three children as well. So he confessed to 27 murders, but like I say, we're not sure how much of that is true. And he gave like very different accounts of all these things to different reporters and people. So really, he was uh, he was writing his confession in prison, and he described his grim appearance as uh, sorry. Someone who was visiting him described him as gruesome and taking a satanical cast. <coughs> Excuse me. And he wrote he was convinced that everything he had done was because of the devil, like he was taken over by the devil. There's actually a really great book called The Devil in the White City. I think it's called, I think it's Eric Larson, and it's one of the best, it, it's about H.H. Holmes. If you get it, it's so good. And let's end this now because we're running out of time and I can't stop coughing. He was hanged at prison in, uh, on May 7th, 1896. See you later. He was hanged for the murder of his buddy and no proof of anything else. But at least he's long gone. Uh, he, um, he, I think he was uh, exhumed twice. So he was exhumed because people thought he escaped the hanging. And then this this long-lost relative of his that thinks he's uh, Jack the Ripper also had him exhumed. And yes, it was Holmes and he was hanged and he did die. And thank God that's one less monster in the world. Uh, so that is the story. <coughs> Sorry for getting so choked up. It certainly wasn't um, the story that was doing it to me. So the castle itself, uh, just to end here, was mysteriously gutted by fire in, in 1895. So it's gone. Uh, there are pictures of it, drawings, and a few photographs, but not very many. But you can see it was really, it was a nightmare. It was a nightmare for those poor women who went there to look for independence. And in popular culture, um, I look that up sometimes, and I know the movie with, I don't, I couldn't find anything about the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, but I'm trying to find the name of the author. <coughs> Sorry. Um, it's, I think it's Eric Larson, but that could be, who knows. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye.